A really special episode today. Jesse and I are joined by Patrick Bro, the Lantern Rouge himself. In today's episode, we're going to have a look at World Tour team budgets. Are they all fake news? Who's to blame when a team does poorly? Is it the riders? Is it the staff? Or should it be the equipment? And what's going on with these watts per kilo calculations? Should we be skeptical? All right, let's get into it. We've got the perfect guest on to help us nut this one out. World Tour team budgets. Is it all fake news? Because I was looking at an article that's now it was from 2021, and it's it's an Ineos budget 50 million euros, UAE budget 35 million euros, and I think Jumbo Visma said 27. So it was two years ago, but to me it seemed very low, especially when you look at the amount of money that the riders are on in their contracts. If you've got, uh, if I say anything that's in miles off here, let me know. But the top, so the top guys, the Grand Tour guys, really good classic guys. Let's say they're three to five million euro contracts a year. Yeah. Um, guys below that sort of super domestiques or you know B level sort of classic one guys. Let's say one one to two. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then you're filling out a rest of a thirty man roster. So let's say Pog's rumored to be on six, right? But Coffers don't have Pog, so they don't have anyone approaching six or four or even. Um, Ineos, I'm not sure about those numbers. They're a little bit old. I mean, some of the some of the articles. I think there was a Le Keep one. It's a little bit lazy because Ineos did publish because they're a British company, public reports, and it said their revenue, uh, 50 euros, mil euros was correct, but that might have flatlined recently. Uh, 22, 23 UAE, I think that's a bit low. Um, <laughs> slash, their traditional sense of budget might be a little bit different to other teams. Um. What do you mean by Yumbo's that? also different Hang because on. they have. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by their traditional set of budget? Wow, well, different to other teams. Just numbers. Well, what you want Mark Hirschi, you go get Mark Hirschi. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the way that's, also, that's, that's that also. I'm pretty sure EF actually. That's not too dissimilar. Like I'm pretty sure Vaud has mentioned he needed. He went to like EF and said, "Going to make a big investment in Carapaz. It's going to cost more than the average rider, and you know they okayed it or provide the, the check. I'm not sure exactly." Um, so it might not, not be too dissimilar, but yeah, I think, you know, they wanted to get on Shimano and leave camp bag. They do that. Um, so whether they're more than any or a bit less, I think they might be around the same. Not sure exactly. Uh, Yumbo, as I said, a bit different because they have the speed skating team, the dev team and the women's team and the men's road team is all wrapped into the same holding company, Dutch holding company. I do think they have public reports. Um, so that all combined, might have been more than that figure. Um, but I think the general, it depends. So for an INEOS, the proportion of the overall budget that's spent on rider salary is could be up to 80%, 75%. Right, but that Because high. of the economies of scale, yeah. And then for a Cofidus who are trying to make ends meet maybe on 11, 13, I'm not sure, or Intermarche 13, 12, let's say lower, lower teens, the rider salary is a lower proportion of that because they still have the same fixed costs of running the team. Um, they still got to support 20 whatever riders. Now, that's Ineos do have more staff. So that might be 65% on rider salary at those teams. And they're really only signing guys on 250, 350. And then they have one guy like a Yoni Zagira, if I had to guess, one mil. I could be off. Sometimes, like, I see them and quotes i'm like that's just crazy but if i had to guess one mil maybe 1.3 and he's like they're one of their best their best gc guy cofidus mm-hmm. um maybe cockard to ride there takes a discount and he win does we won a race at two down under um and a pascal ackerman at uae they had to pay him a bomb to go there because yeah. you know there's no necessary there's no loyalty like there is for a cockard to a french team um mm. So it varies hugely between the small and big teams. It's obviously an unfair game. Um, that being said, you can outperform your budget like Intermarche have shown last year and this year to a certain extent. You can underperform your budget. Some teams have a really big budget. I think AG2R got a, and Trek have got a pretty healthy budget. And if you look at you look at the, the Neo Pros Trek off and sign, U23 world, U23 world champion, European U23 champion, TT, and so they're not 50K Neo pros either. Quinn Sims, for example, um, 
So I know, but a lot of it's guesswork too. Yeah. What What about the staffing then? Because I mean, from you often hear that it's the support structure, and I think both of us can probably say that we've heard enough from people that we know in there that it is the support structure around the riders, so the staffing, that really makes a big impact. And does I'm that underpaid. sort of translate through to a through to a salary? side of, of the stuff. I mean, like I have no idea what a quote unquote DS makes sitting in a car eating pies shouting at his riders. Like sorry. <laughs> it again varies between the teams, I think. It does vary. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like I think so. And it also depends on the tax structure. So I mean I don't know it's exactly I could be completely wrong, but I think don't know of any French AGU to R riders living in Andorra. And so whether they're required to live in France, I, I don't know. But read the staff, I think it varies. Like INEOS, I would expect the first DS at INEOS to be being paid more than obviously the second DS or even the first DS at, yep. again, Cofidis, Antimache, not to harp on them. I'm just, they have a lot no, of no, budget no, no. than yep. INEOS, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, quick step, maybe don't pay that. Maybe Tom Steele's and Peters are just doing it for the love of the game and they're on 70, 80 grand. Yeah. And any <laughs> yeah. ones are on 150, 200 plus. I don't know. Uh, but I don't think it's not, it's not like the NBA or, or Premier League. I, I don't think like Acre, let's take Acre Visa big, for example. I won't talk about Yumbo because obviously I work for them. So let's talk about Intermarche. Acre Visa big. I doubt he's on. Who's sorry? I, who's, I have no. I've never heard that name before. Who's that? So he is. He was at DSM when they w- had won. I think the Giro with Dumoulin and Dumoulin came second Giro. Oh no, and then second tour, and then when there was Sunweb, and yep. then he he came to Intermarche at the start of last year, I think, or maybe the winter before, and he took them from basically the CCC team that sold the license to Intermarche from one of the worst teams in world tour because they had a world tour license they were at serious risk of relegation and he scouted binium signed binium himself he he like focused on the points properly he he was he's their like head ds performance guy he's their kind of what brailsford used to be what rod ellingworth is now what zayman is at yumbo visma um and vespeak basically transformed that team to at worst a top 10 team but a team that won hen vavelham etc and is winning lots of races. And I doubt he's on 1.5 million. But there'll be riders probably on more than him who do not contribute as much of an impact on that team's winning as he does of, because of his changes compared to the average man- manager. And that's just an inefficiency in the market. Whereas in, if you look at Premier League or what are the Boston Red Sox off of Billy Bean when he was at the oh. Oakland A's? Like, Something crazy, you know. American I, I was, I was actually, I'm glad you mentioned Billy Bean. So I was, gonna, I hadn't put this in the show notes, but I think the question needs to be asked: Are you the Billy Bean of pro cycling at this point? But that'll mean nothing to Jesse. No. But I think that needs to be at some point discussed. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're you're right. Like, and that's that's kind of, I wouldn't mind getting that into into that a little bit later when we maybe talk about specific teams, but just how this. Um, the support structure under underwriters really impacts essentially their performance at the end of the day. Um, well, like for example, a coach with a PhD with experience could be on with a, this is with a PhD and with world two experience could be on anywhere from 70 to 120, and some could be on more. That's probably less than people think. You can make more money just doing your own coaching, but especially if you've got a freaking PhD. Okay. But the average the average world tour rider on 120k, the experience one. I'm sorry, but I'm sure they might they get bottles. That is an essential team function, but they don't significantly contribute to winning races or scoring points. The average 120k rider, they don't. So Alex Dassett uploaded a video recently where he, he said it was a, a guide to the best kit, which I thought was going to be his kind of breakdown from all his wind tunnel experience and unbiased, and unsponsored, like Jesse. It's, it was in the thumbnail. Now it was it was anything but uh, but that it ended up being kind of weird sharing of world tour opinions on equipment, but without any actual 
explanations of why. So I thought we'd maybe do the video he did, but give some give some more detail on it. Um, so a couple of things. Now he did, I will give him credit. There's a few things he did add, which I thought was was interesting around sort of why teams, um, certain teams will run like a ceramic speed OSPW with Shimano and then Shimano don't really like it. So the Shimano sponsored teams tend not to run those sorts of things, which I thought was interesting. But especially we'll start off like the biggest one he keeps repeating is that all the all the riders basically want to be on a specialized team because they'd be going faster. Or a trek. The specialized one wasn't surprising to me. Specialized, uh, not surprising. Philip Gilbert was on. Sorry to cut you off, Jesse, but Philip Gilbert was on Lotto last year and literally like putting Instagram posts up glorifying specialized. Now he's the minute he's retired, he's on special. The trek one, did that surprise you? Not really. They do have the heritage, and I, I honestly do think the new Madome would be a fantastic bike. Didn't surprise me um, yet, you know, not at all. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. We've just, we've just glossed over something here. So, LR, you're not surprised at all by the specialised thing. Are you not surprised by it because, because you, you hear the chat in, in the bunch that, that there is this perceived advantage, or is there an actual advantage like is there a documented ad advantage so there's two things so i think douse's video was good because it's a pretty accurate reflection of a lot of what you hear probably in the the anglo cycling sphere because i assume he doesn't he's friends with more english speaking riders than french and italian riders um but it's a good representation of what pro cyclists think which is important uh and what i hear as well but i think there needs to be there's a distinction between bike frame and the, the overall setup you get because of the bike frame you use is two different things. I think probably the special road bike, the, the new Scott's supposed to be good. I think all the, the S5, the pin, I think there's much of a muchness between them. The real gains is, or even a Canyon, the Air Road MVP uses. But then MVDP has to use, well, except for a Tour de France TT where they made him use a a white label laser and Abus helmet and the special guys are using the special helmet and they're using the Rovar wheels, which are probably quick with the, um, the specialized frame. And so it's, then what bars can they use? And that's where again, okay. Yumbo used Cervelo and then they changed from Shimano to Shram, but the Shimano to, Sh to Shram change is not just about the group set change. It meant they could change their power meter because Shimano make you use your Shimano power meter. The Shimano power pedals. meter estimator, you mean? Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. which is a whole thing with the components. Like half the pro peloton is using a power meter that if you look at the, a lot of the independent reviews, <laughs> and, uh, and crash and hot. So, yeah. And yeah. then you look at UAE, they change from cam Campag because they could afford to. So it's not just about like the frame. And I do think the frames are much of a muchness. At the top end, there are some that are that aren't as good and i do think there are differences is that like a do i have any documented evidence of that no it's more just following like especially on the tt bikes for example look at equipo kern farmer you may not have heard of them spanish pro conti team they're not very good i think they ran top 10 or something in the vuelta team time trial last year and i was like what the hell, what the hell? and it's because they're on the giant setup which i think is pretty slick because jayco go pretty well on it and so it's like there's an overperformance there that has to be the equipment because the riders aren't that good generally. So what I picked up like in well, one of the things that kind of shitted me a little bit about that video was um, it felt a little bit like he kind of was punching down on the non, how do I put this, like punching down on maybe the non-Anglo brands and maybe that maybe what you said there is because that's the sort of, people that he chats with like there was like this passing comment of like um oh uh maybe you can help us with this but like yumbo wanted to get away from bianchi or it was some was something along those lines they were quick they were well. it was they were quick to move quick to move and i'm like yeah, it doesn't rob which ride around in slovenia at home on his old bianchi well that's kind of like <laughs> as far it? i'm sorry like <laughs> putting all the all the the bullshit aside like those bikes were sick like they were absolutely sick so I just maybe maybe a bit of that chat then is and like you sort of said it's like they're almost 
they want to head back to Anglo brands potentially? Like is there more comfort in that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, like probably uh, the average American rider's not like get me on a time, you know, a time climbing frame, uh, the time Alpe d'Huez classic climbing frame or a look frame. Probably that's true. And I reckon what a coffer to son. Some team look back in the peloton, they're going pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On the road bikes. Yep. Um, I, I really think it's it's more to do with like who's your head performance sort of engineer, what's the overall system you're putting together. I think there probably is some sort of advantage for the b- bike brands that have their in-house wheel manufacturer, which is Trek, which is Specialized, which is Cervelo, because you would assume they're test when they're doing our wheels. Twenty percent faster this year. It's tested on their S five because reserve, I think, is Cervelo as well. So maybe there's an advantage there. Um, but yeah, like I think a, a Sw- Scott Swiss, right? Are they Swiss. Yeah. Like they're not yeah. that pop. They're not no, as flashy true. as a Spech. They. It's probably just as fast the frame, honestly. Or who would know? Um, <laughs> but Quickstep Bora have got better riders than DSM for the most part. So. It's all again hard to know exactly how much it's the frame, the tires, the wheels, whatever. He didn't even mention the tires, and he said helmets are benign and riders don't care. I'm like, what? Helmets um, make a big difference. Yeah, Remco Aero helmet. If it you can put it put it on a guy and then his head cooks. Like, didn't Remco in Tour de Suisse last year wear an Aero helmet on the wrong day and he said his head fried like a fried egg and he lost loads of time and. So I think helmets, especially in the TT, um, we've probably been talking about road bike set up a little bit more, but or yeah. here's, a, here's a good one. Last one, the Cube. No one says anything about the Cube road bike. But Intermarche, those guys, they, I think they really like it and the manufacturers worked with them and they've introduced what, I don't know what it is, the Air Lightning or something, like a hybrid yeah. climbing and it, it's supposed to be good. It's light, it, he can hit the weight limit. And if you look at the performances of their riders, of course, they've also had like a visa be improving the actual physiological performance, but no one's like, oh yeah, the cube is great. But I think it is pretty good. Yeah, I've seriously underrated bike, I reckon, the cube, because they do that aero frame in a new super lightweight build. And yeah, it's under seven, I think. And it's a full on aero frame. It's just interesting from a YouTube perspective though, because we can kind of say, well, it's true from like a world tour perspective that the riders, you know, he's if he's just parroting what their chat is. But you can't, it's kind of funny, you can't really get away with that on YouTube now. Like even the comments on that video and on his Instagram post, most recent one, people aren't happy. They don't like, they don't like it. And I think it's oh, kind really? of, the, it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of the Hambini influence, I think, coming in where people just, they can just smell a pile of BS from a mile away. And I was kind of happy. I, I watched the video without reading the comments. I was like, oh, this this is slop. And then I read the comments and I scrolled down. I was like, oh, thank God. There's like people are getting it. It doesn't 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 wash these days, I don't think. Cool yeah, to it's see. like impossible to test. It's, it's almost impossible. How are you going to get? You have to get a fully set up bike from each pro team. And then what? Control test them all with the same tires and wheels and everything. It'd be, it's almost impossible undertaking to really know. Yeah, but even on YouTube land, even if you haven't tested it, at least give some people want some theories. They want some ideas. Give us some tube shapes. Some you're on the weight limit, you're not, you know, the tire clearance. Like people want at least some ideas that you've done a bit of um kind of research or or, or come up with some ideas as to why these sort of um these opinions in the the world tour are there instead of just saying them, I guess. And it was cool to see the bit of pushback in the comments. Well, the clearest one is to look out for when a pro rider is not using sponsor approved equipment because that's that's the tell they think what they when mvdp gets what was it cam Worth's front wheel driven from andorra to the time trial in the tour de france tt and wears the white label helmet there's your answer they don't think their sponsor helmet's too slick well isn't that essentially what uae are doing where they seem to have so sort much of. money they kind of just test and run whatever they want Sort thing. of. I think they still have to use the Shimano power meters. Um, so I, I don't think they buy the Shimano because they're still using the power meters. Um, but yeah, they obviously envy probably, they're using envy wheels. I doubt yep. envy financially were matching what Campag could pay for their wheel and group set combination. And probably Campag, would, I would expect, it's UA half, pretty much an Italian team on a Colnago. 
they I assume offer more than Shimano. So that must that's also another one. When a team changes and the money doesn't really make sense, it's like, well, they must be going for performance there. And then you see Pog with the flared handlebars and um his setup looks completely different. So yeah, that's another big tell. I think both you and I, Jesse, would just feel that we would get absolutely slammed for for putting something up like that that was kind of just a broad um sort of cookie cutter kind of approach to what everyone's thinking like I could I could do a video about what the what the Sydney bunches are thinking about in terms of in terms of their bikes. What are they thinking provide. about? Man, it's just S5s. It's just S5s. <laughs> Every it's really? It's just Cervelos. Yeah. yeah. Is that what's hot? So, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know, the drink, the S5 drinking game's just kicked off again. <laughs> I just can't. I just can't do it again. Oh, no, no, stuff it. I'm going to say this. Right. So I did, uh, I did a ride with a guy last week. Yeah. Am I going to talk about this? Yeah, I'm going to quickly yep. talk about this. Guy last week. And I, res- like, massively respect this dude. He's, like, he's about 10, 10 years older than me. He's been riding for bloody millenniums and um he was on an r5 that's the road version i think right now he's kind of works in the industry so put put that aside that he's he works in the industry so he's not paying retail for a lot of these things but he's right ridden a trillion trillion bikes and he just started riding an s5 and i was like okay right you are the one man the one man who i know will give me an unbiased is this actually different? And he just turned to me and said, Chris, I would still be getting dropped at Heffron A grade on this bike and on the other bike. And I would be riding just as fast around Centennial Park at the chop on this bike as I would on that bike. So for me, it's it's now settled. Put your wind tunnel testing aside. My main man has told me that it's much of a muchness. So what do you actually do at Jumbo Visma? Can you tell us? Oh, what do I actually do? <laughs> yeah. a good question. I guess it's like the modern version of, I don't know what Alan Piper was doing at UAE when he was there in 2020, 2021, but I guess it might be something a little bit similar, but maybe with more of a, a data and video focus. So like primarily it's making videos like my highlight videos with all the fun stripped out and more tactics and custom catering to Yumbo, their goals, what they want, what we're seeing in opponents, etc. cetera. Um, just that stuff because, you know, what did, oh, X Rider's a bad descender. We all know that. But do we? Let's take a look at these moments where on actual video, instead of just some moment we might all be thinking about in our minds, we can put the video up and, and show this is where he has problems, this is X, Y, Z. So that's one. Then there's overall like strategy um, for for race days for the major races, cla- monuments, grand tours, some one weeks, um, like stage by stage analysis, like what we're going to do on each stage, what we think teams will do. I just I provide input on that. Obviously, I don't I don't have the final decision on anything. Um, I just provide a third party input from someone who watches all the races and is not like day to day on their bus in their bubble, clouded by, you know by all that uh, yep, all the relationship stuff yeah so so that's probably the second one and the third one which has kicked off a bit more this year is some moneyball stuff yeah some rider scouting analysis that sort of stuff um it's not really because like it's not like baseball because yeah there's watts per kilo which is instructive um which we'll get to in a second but there's no like uh, win like war statistics or on base percentage um you really and even your pro cycling stats because a lot of people just get signed based on their pro cycling stats polaris and how much they chart their salaries because of that whereas you know as you know if a guy could i know a guy he was in the last seven riders on a mountain top finish they were going super quick in a world tour race recently he was there late and then when he dropped, he had to wait for his teammate who dropped four kilometers earlier to then pull him. And so instead of finishing seventh or eighth, he's finished 18th. If you look at PCS, you won't know that. So I was sort of watching the races, figuring like figuring out what teams are doing, understanding how teams are 
putting their riders in a position to succeed or not to succeed. I would say they're putting that rider in a position not to succeed personally. And that sort of scouting. And that's not really money ball. That's still pretty eye testy. That rider that you just discussed, would that be now documented somewhere that this, this, that particular situation occurred and therefore that's why his result was, was, was as such? Like is that, a, is, that, is that now a note on that rider's bio somewhere that is able to be pulled up? Yeah, so he was already on a short list. And so that goes on there in the, in the master spreadsheet. Okay. Um, but I, I basically have a, it's not really a long list and that's purely off just, am I, are we, should we be interested in this rider merits further review, you know, and then it's, it's still pretty analog, it's still pretty basic. Um, but then, yeah, it's that stuff. It's building that as well. That's um, a massively valuable commodity. Like I would have thought, especially given that there's clearly not much of this going on. Like, well, because you can't go back. You can't no. go back in time. Like yeah. in November, no one's going to go back and watch the whole of um, Tirreno Adriatico in November. Like literally the whole <laughs> race. No one's going to do that. So if you don't do it contemporaneously, it's lost forever. Even if you have the video footage, it's lost forever. And you also got to be knowing what you're looking for. And if you watch in November, you forget what was happening at that time, what the storylines were, what the DSs might have been thinking because of X, Y, Z. So... And is it is it basically it's film it's film room stuff. So it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, NFL nothing players will watch American watch film on the game. Will they will they do do similar stuff? Like that's that's yeah, what we're talking about. Yeah, it's nothing groundbreaking. How much of your time is spent doing that? Because I was having a look at poke around the sort of the things you're doing in the media space at the moment. You've got your YouTube channel, you've obviously do the podcast with Benji, and you've got your website, which we'll get onto because it's got all the Watts per kilo stuff on it, and then the Yumbo Visma stuff. What's the split here? I'm just curious. Of your, your sort of your working time, um, oh, the media stuff would be the like actual company is probably ninety percent of the time. Yeah, okay, um, that's like the full time everything. The Yama stuff's like on the side because there's only five monuments, there's only three grand tours. Like it's not that much. Uh, or nah, I, that's probably underselling a little bit. It is. I probably just work a lot, so. You know, it is, I don't know, uh, it's hard to put a few hours, you know, hours per week on it because November I might do nothing, December do nothing. Um, talk about the Tour de France route reveal. What do you think? What stage looks good? All right, we'll talk about that later in February. Um, but then, you know, obviously now now super busy, Giro prep. So like really, really busy prepping the Giro. And then during the Giro, we super busy prepping the Tour. Um, so, but then after the tour, it'd be chill, uh, and then scouting and stuff that sort of ongoing, the scouting is just through watching the races. It's not, yeah, just, I understand. And then in my spare time, I'll maybe make a couple of notes here and there about, oh, okay. That rider who he did a, he did a nice pull there or something like he did a nice lead out in this small 2.1 race that I was, you know, one of five people watching. I think that was really impressive. His, his sprinter wouldn't have won without what he did. Um, and no one will see that on the, on the stat sheet for lack of a better word. Um, but that's kind of, that's not that much additional work because I'm watching the races anyway. But that's a big mm. time. Like Jesse, like just physically, I don't, I don't think people quite realize how much pro cycling you watch. Like yeah, if I, it's <laughs> quite concerning. I watch about five, I'll <laughs> skip through the video and watch the last five minutes. You're watching the whole damn thing. <laughs> go like, watch everything. Paris Bay, watch every minute. Because you want to understand what teams are thinking in the break formation phase, who's trying to get in the break. Um, like, why is he not getting in the break? Is he sick? Like, Jan van Kersbrook, he didn't try and get in the break in Paris Bay. This guy on a pro Conti team. And it's just perplexed me now for four days. Like, why didn't he try to get in the break? He got in the break in Flanders, got in the break in, in Dwarves Duo or E3. Why didn't he try to get in the break? Uh, things like that. You, you won't pick that up. And obviously, like, someone has to watch it, I guess. Um, but I, I must, I must be passionate about it and love it. I guess the only answer, otherwise I wouldn't. How did that job come up? Moraine called Benji, I think. No, no, I, I know. No, I think Moraine called Benji. They wanted a video and video analyst, um, kind of like a traditional, you know, like a Premier League club would have a video yep. cutter, yep. video cool. analyst. Yeah, okay. Um, yep. and then it just expanded and then Benji pulled me in very kindly. And then it just expanded from there. Um, when they realized, oh, like. 
you know, this what's peculiar stuff, you watch every race and it sort of just expanded. Uh, also cause maybe like it's hard to explain because often in my YouTube videos or on the podcast, it's not, it's not the same product. Like it really mm. isn't like I'm trying to be entertaining to make it. I'm trying to make this race interesting to as many people as possible on a highlight video. I'm trying to make say funny things. I don't it's even funny. care about being wrong necessarily because you know, that might, it's just my opinion in that moment. Of course I could call 17 people. I could, do, but it, it's not that, it's not that deep. It's a bike race trying to make it entertaining for people. And then the Yumbo stuff is completely different because it's like a, more what I did before I started Lantern Rouge when I was a lawyer or whatever, or from my finance degree, because I like majored in, did commerce measuring in finance and econometrics. And I was really good at econometrics, um, which is where some of the data stuff comes in. And that's like spreadsheets, PowerPoints, presentations, reports, and giving your like informed opinion. It's not like, yeah, I think it'd be funny if you sign this rider. Um, it's, I reckon the best part, it's not the best part, but it's the most underrated part of your videos is the humor. Like that humor is, is my humor. I get a laugh out of it. And you'll always pick like, whether it's the dog on the side of the road or the look from one rider to, to another. And the little kind of piss takey bit that you say is exactly the kind of, what's the word I'm after? It's like, um. You're smart ass. You're being a smart ass. And I absolutely, like it's hundred percent my humor. I, well, that was the problem when I started doing, when I signed the deal with ASO, I was doing it from Australia, the highlight videos. And I was so tired. But those videos are so boring. The first initial, uh, the first initial official highlight videos I did with, with licensed footage. Cause I was, first of all, I was worried ASO had taken a big leap of faith. I didn't want to sort of put the bucket hat on just be going <laughs> off the handle. They're like, what the hell? <laughs> we just go, he's like going to make the races look like a joke. And then, you know, loosened up, moved over, time zone all sorted. And I sort of went back a little bit to maybe some of the funniest stuff. Um, like I just put up a women's video analyzing the crash at Roubaix in the velodrome. And, you know, try to be, not try to be, I just I was just a little bit looser, you know, had yep. some time to do it and a bit funnier. Um, John Boy. I really like John Boy's highlight videos. I, I want to do a few more non highlights. So he doesn't really do he doesn't do MLB baseball game highlights. He finds interesting moments and it has a funny story around it. And I want to do more of those videos. How does that work workflow wise? So if you're are you having let's say you're getting it's mid tour or whatever it is, like how do you get the the footage and then turn it out that day. Like I assume you're not just screen recording the video. ASO send it. Um, <laughs> ASO send it. I cut it up into, I cut it up first in final cut, the file and all the moments I want, the screenshots I want to pause and talk about um, in, and also I have a minute cap. So it's got to be, you know, I cut up and make sure it's five minutes of race footage in that timeline. That doesn't include photos, you know, graph, whatever. And then I'll just record off the top over that. No script, just what's sort of been percolating in my head. Uh, so this is another little niche one. So though, when you've paused and you're commentating over the screenshot, it always lines up exactly when the screenshot ends. Is that because you've set the amount of time and you're speaking to that or do you trim it after? I've always wondered how you get that. I trim after. Okay. I trim the screenshot after, yeah. Okay. So the screenshots will just be put in there like four seconds, but I can drag them out seven, nine, twelve, yeah. whatever. It's mu once I've recorded the audio, it's like from recording the audio once that's done to out, it's like twenty minutes. Um, but I from yeah. probably if I was hustling from stage end, if I wasn't recording a podcast and got the file immediately downloaded, I could probably turn it in like an hour. So I've like an hour fifteen. If I was really hustling, or if it was a boring sprint stage, Roubaix, yeah. think, things like Roubaix are a nightmare. How do you? Yeah. How do like I put do you, Roubaix which bit into do you five minutes of race footage? Yeah, it's impossible. Yeah, and yeah, that that was sort of so you've watched the race, so then you get the footage. Do you know going in right? Well, I'm yes. going to highlight that. Okay, you know your talking yeah. point at that point. Yeah. Oh, give or take. Yeah. Give like, or take. 
you know, maybe maybe I stretch it a little bit because I want to talk about it. I end up thinking actually this will be a funny a bit or, you know, so, Tudor Hungary, for example. Like you, you guys, no offense to you, you're probably not tuning into Tudor Hungary live every day. No uh, offense, Tudor. I doubt it. Not the full stage <laughs> at least. Um, maybe I talk about the horse running next to the peloton for two minutes <laughs> in full because... There was there was it, a breakdown of its its CDA, yeah. I think, at one point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because oh like, let's be real. I'm not going to talk about Groenewegen winning a Hungary sprint for five minutes. Um, in the Tour de France, I obviously wouldn't do that. It'd be like five seconds, half. half let's move on because we've got Jonas or Pog doing something crazy. Uh, so it varies by race. The, and, and a lot of actually like this, the smaller race organizers are very happy with it because. It's finding that there is something interesting in all their races if you just pick it out and package it in the right way. So what? Just on that, what what do the punters want? Like what what do what metrics what videos work for you? Is it like is it the superstars doing something dominant? Is it like a a crazy stupid crash, or is it um a, like a, a Roubaix where it's an actually really good race, but there's no, I suppose, key moment that you can kind of grasp some because it's just a it's a it's a novel. It's not necessarily like a, a highlights package. Like, what what are there names that that work best? So it's all those things. So like, and I now have probably three, four, five years of data, yeah. and like the YouTube data is it's not no one's lying with their views. People don't. Yeah. Oh, I actually like that, but that you know. A view is a view. That person wanted to watch that. That person didn't want to watch that. So number one, unfortunately, is crashes. Crashes, they will break the cycling bubble like um, Opiomi. Like yep. that's just, that sort of thing is mega viral and it happens. Then the second thing is size of the race. So you pair a big crash like that with a big race like the Tour, you just have pure virality. Um that's just the reality. People say it's bad. Well, everyone's clicking on it. That's just unfortunate. Um, second is probably, as I said, yeah, the races make a big difference, um, but less than you might think. Like I can get probably, you know, on a dot start list, I would say is marginally more important outside of Tour de France. Tour de France is just ridiculous, unique beast. Um, the key is to have two well-known competitors going head to head. So Pagacha v. Jonas in 2021 Tour de France didn't satisfy that test because no one knew who Jonas, who Jonas was. was. Yep. And then you have to have, there's a lag period. And so Sagan was still hot as a name in the tour last year. He had that. So then you have a controversial moment. It's another big one. He, says something to Wout Van Aert because Wout Van Aert pushed him to the barriers in a sprint last year in the Tour. And because Sagan's a big name and it's a controversial moment, that's going to pop. Uh, and there's a lag, even though Sagan's not good anymore. And so Jonas now is in that sphere. Pog is in that sphere. Remco's in that sphere. And Roglic is too. And Wout and MVDP. And so, but you need them competing against each other, dropping them, quote unquote, you know, my title, destroying yep. each other. Yep. Um, and that's yep. what the punters want. Yep. And so have we reached a point where Pog destroys field, gets more clicks than Chris Froome destroys field? Well, if Chris Froome did that, I would actually bang because no yeah. <laughs> everyone would be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? Because yeah. um, when he got in the break with Peacock last year, that did do big numbers yeah. in the tour because everyone was like, what? He came third on the Alpe d'Huez stages. And so I just, no. just talking just from a from this removed part of the world, like – Pogacar hasn't, it's not mainstream, it's not, it hasn't cut through. No, because he, because he's, the reality is he's not from America, he's not from the UK and we, yep. I'm producing content in English media, English language media, you guys, and we consume largely that content. So yeah, the reality is if he was American or English, he'd have more Instagram followers probably and more, there'd be more views on the videos. Um, that's the reality why Lance was so big. And Froome was so big. So, but he is, he's still like, he is, the name is now getting more and more recognized as time goes on. 
Just let me explain this. This may, may not make sense, but there is a question coming at the end of it, all right? So with sporting teams and stuff, what, what tends to happen well, on all of these sort of chat shows is they will kind of put a pie chart up and appoint blame, quote unquote, and not necessarily a negative thing, but just the, the overall kind of um, performance of a team. And they'll put a pie chart, pie chart up and break it down into players, coaches, staff, and maybe individuals, maybe certain controversies that took place throughout the season that impacted it and, and break it down that way. So DSM, EF Education, and Bike Exchange, for me, kind of sit in that proper middle shelf, right? Proper middle shelf of, of World Tour team. We had to break it down into riders, their in-race tactics, the off-bike logistics, and their equipment, which I think we can go through. I think all three of those teams, DSM, EF, and Jayco, have very, very good equipment relative yeah. to their budgets. I think I think they're making. Uh, I feel bad for misremembering his name, um, Pinotti, at Jayco. Yep. I think he's with the TT stuff, crash hot. I think did like Yum. You see the squad Yumbo sent to the Paris for the team time trial. Yep. And Jayco only lost, and EF only lost by like a handful of seconds with right like. Okay, Kel's great and Court are great, but like Yumbo had like TTT World TT World Champions, like three of them or something in the team. So they're obviously UAE they tour. Good, they were yeah, they UAE smashed tour. the TTT. They were great. So in some aspects, I think the equipment is good. I think some of the TT stuff is good. Um, first of all, it is budgets. Like money can cover a lot of sins if you can just sign the you know, whoever, a guy, a GC contender that comes up for grabs and they can perform for you and you're not getting great value. You're not getting the best value out of the deal, but you pay three mil. They do win some races. Like Ineos, for example, in 2021, they signed Adam Yates after he'd been a proven GC guy. So you're not getting any discount. But he won Volta of Catalunya. Yep. He did well at some, some other races. He was a consistent performer. I think he came third in Lombardia or second in Lombardia. He didn't win the tour or podium the tour, fourth in the Vuelta. So, like, money can cover some sins. So that's where they're at a disadvantage. But as I said with Intermarche, like, you can also be a bit a bit smarter. And Jayco have been very traditionally set up team where they have, like, it's three key riders. It's changing a little bit, but it, it's Matthews. For the Ardennes and for the sort of, yeah, the Cobble Classics, there's, there's been a, a, a huge burden put on Matthew since he returned. And, and the Matthew the stages, key... quote unquote. Yep. Are they still Matthew yep. stages? They've gone back to being Matthew stages after Matthew he stages. won last year in the yep. tour. They're back, yeah. Yep. So, and then there's Yates as the GC guy, Simon, and then there's Groenewegen as the pure bunch sprinter. And so then they construct the other seven riders to support those riders in the races. It's not necessarily a bad thing if you have a limited budget. Um, though, are there other opportunities where it's overly conservative tactically where Yumbo, despite having the guy probably about to win the tour, are comfortable with this guy going in the break for a stage, this guy doing that? Does it actually, when you really think about it and look at it, do you need seven guys around your GC guy at all times, at all hours of the day? Not really. And and Jayco did let Nick Schultz in the break last year and he only won a stage from the break. Uh, and that, So I think they did change last year. Matthews, instead of chasing all day on that stage you won, and maybe the break wins anyway, he just went in the break with a teammate. And you know what? When Michael Matthews is against breakaway level riders, he can make them look, you know, much worse than him because he's a guy that comes third in San Remo or fourth in world championships. But I, so I, I would argue that, that, that tactics that's, as well. that's the exception rather than the rule with them. Like we're talking it about been, that yeah. because it was the, the, yeah, it was, it was not, it was off, off their usual standard practice. Vuelta 21 is the, the case study where EF put court in the break and he won three, uh, won two break stages and maybe won one Roglicy sprint. But he won definitely won two breaks, one with Simmons and Jayco chased all day and they didn't catch them because they were going for the Matthews in the sprint. And it's a huge burden on the teammates, whereas 
the other EF riders are just chilling in the yeah. group apart from Craddock in yeah. the break. So it is a bit of tactics because Jacob got good riders. Kel's a really good rider. This, um, this is this is something you want to sort of pick up on, isn't it, Jesse? Like there seems to be so many guys who go into Jaco and they just like Kel who just turn into donkeys. Well, yeah, like, in terms of like breaking down why the teams are doing well or not or not doing well on that pie chart sort of thing. I was kind of looking at like I think I mentioned is that oh well EF have more 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 winners, more guys capable of winning. But maybe that's just credit to their team because maybe the ones that go to Jaco are just as good on paper or talented and then 100%. end up just they lose the they lose the touch because they never get those opportunities. No, I maybe think that is a tactical thing. Better. You reckon? Yeah. 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 It, Jaco signed Stebar and Demarkey. Demarkey's thirty six. He might win a Giro stage from the break, but he's not gonna. You know, he's not gonna consistently win races or help you win too many races. Like that's who. Okay. He is. Well, look. Instead um, of instead of doing it like a pie chart, then. Let's let's do it head to head with each of those sectors. Can okay, I, those three say- teams. Those three teams. Let's 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 stack those factors up against each other. And so, if I was to say riders, just pure riders on their roster, not how they got on the roster, but who has a better roster across those three? My take is EF probably have a better roster. Yeah, just. But Matthew's, Matthew's thing is, though, like, it's different because if you wanted to say for this Tour de France to nailed on who's going to win a stage, I'd probably go with Gronewegen at Jayco because there's about eight sprint stages and he is pretty, he is pretty quick and he might get it right one day. Um, <laughs> if, if, if I needed one quarterback and it was the fourth yeah. quarter with one final drive, who would I? Yeah, I know. It, it does. EF don't it, have a sprinter. But if yeah. I was, who's more likely to podium the tour was obviously EF with Carapaz. Um, who's DSM's? What's DSM sprinter then? So Wellsford. Wellsford's Wellsford. really good. Wellsford's 100%. really, really good. Yeah. He's so been getting, getting more paid. results than Gronewagen. Recently. Yeah, he's, he, he's better than Gronewagen. Okay. He's better than him. Um, Gronewagen's probably on six times more than him. Maybe more. <laughs> But, um, so what can I just? Where are these decisions being made on? Because you mentioned uh, well, Steve and contract. Demarkey. Okay, but like, what, what? Why are the teams seemingly so poor? While some teams just seem to make bad decisions in the riders they pick. Like it seems obvious when you mention it. You're like, yeah, Demarkey, you know, maybe one stage, and Steve Barr is probably done. But there was some decision made there. What any any tea on that? Didn't why they let Schiltz go as well? Wasn't it Schiltz they let go this year? Well, he was supposed to go to B&B and then they folded and then he had to take a late minute, last minute deal at Israel on a one year, even but they though were he letting came him second right? in a Tour de France stage by this much. Yeah. But he wanted you know, to up leave. Up and coming Aussie and they were letting him go. Yeah. But look at Is all that- Hindley, O'Connor, Vine. They're not on Jayco. Are they doing, is there like favours between the people picking the riders? And the riders themselves, or like, some seems obviously bad picks. Um, it, it might just be money. I don't know. It might like maybe they can't afford. And if you want to guarantee Tour de France stages for your sponsor, then you, maybe you go with Gronovig. And I know they were interested uh, uh, reportedly in doing. Like, I don't. I don't know. It. Um, that being said, w- we know that Jay Vine wasn't looking for five million euros a year and a half ago. So. It, Money can't be the only explanation. Um, so credit to Alperson for extending him initially, and then obviously now he's at UA and the rest is history. But the I think it's scouting, probably, to be honest. Like Akev Eastbeck knew that Binium was at Delco, a French Pro Conti team that might fold, and he was good. And and if you look at Jaco, they often sign riders that might have done well in like Saskatoon, a Czech race, which they often do, or another race, or it's it's Hmm. often just oh he was good at a race we were at um he's pretty strong bring him in but there there's definitely an italian contingent there's Mm. a sobrero colioni de marchi some there's there's a move to sign a lot of these italians whereas ef seems to so is voiters is voiters making those calls you think and i think that they're just ef are not and this is an advantage ef are not geo restricted and so half over half the teams 
look at a pool of riders that's like a third of the total volume because they only want they want to have over half the team or a certain proportion of the team from some nationalities. Like Trek have Danes, somehow barely have any Americans. Um, they have a lot of Danes because probably is Kim Anderson a DS there and there's some there's probably some Danish people in the staff. Your, your tactics your tactics are dictated to by the riders that are in your roster. But I, I kind of think is that is that thought about before the the roster is selected, and this is kind of what I wanted to get to no. because, okay, that's and that's yeah, <laughs> because you know in an NBA team, right? Like a trade is made to to put a put a player on a place to how they fit into the equation. Like you're not going to yes. put like you know two centers like Embiid and Jokic together. That's not going to happen, right? And so I kind of feel with cycling. Like there's no there's no planning to this. It's like, oh, okay, maybe with a sprinter there might be. Like they're not going to have Cavendish, Grunewagen and and bloody Jakobsen all on the same team. I get that. But everything else just does, just seems to be kind of ad hoc. And that that is my rant about Jake. <laughs> Ultimately, when it comes down to it, is it just seems to be like, uh, uh, yeah, yep. Oh, you up and coming Aussie who's in the track team? Yep. Uh, up, uh, no, haven't heard of you. Not in the Australian bubble. No, we won't have you, Jay. That's EF's, I think, biggest weakness. They, I look through their roster and all their signings every year. I'm like, nice signing, nice sign. He's a nice rider, good pickup. And then they send a team to a race, and it's like, how does this all fit together? Who gets the bottles? Who's going to pull to launch the attack? Who can? Who has a bit of a sprint? Who, like, like there's not. And you look at their classics team. Really, it kind of happened with Paulus being good. They didn't even send Paulus to classics races last year. They didn't even really know he was good at classics, even though he came fourth at Leuven in world championships. Um, so yeah, it's team construction is a really underrated because a lot of teams, like Adam Yates, for example, UA have signed Adam Yates. I presume both, firstly, to probably score well in one weeks and also take the load off Pagaccia in maybe the Italian hilly classics later in the year, so he can take a bit of a load off, but I presume to help him in the Tour de France as a domestique. Adam Yates has literally never performed in that role, ever. And he sort of could have done that for G in the Tour last year and didn't perform in that role. So now maybe he could, he might, he might but you could also sign a guy on 300K, 400K, and he can't TT at all. But who cares? His job's not to be a GC rider. His job is to go on the front of the mountains and pull at whatever was per kilo. And he, he can't position. He can't position in hectic run-ins. I'm basically talking about Sepp Kuz right now. Not yeah. that I'm not saying that was his salary, but you could probably find someone, whatever. Or Nick Schultz, for example. Nick Schultz yeah. probably not a great TT. Nick Schultz probably can't keep himself in GC. I reckon Nick Schultz could pull at a decent was per kilo, and he certainly is, doesn't cost the same as as Adam Yates. These watts per kilo calculations that are posted on, well, your website, I think you have some people that do them. Could you just br- give us everyone a primer on how they're calculated? Because you're using a different system to, it's like something to do with, it's, it's for a 60 kilo rider. Is, is that right? It's all yeah. weighted so, to? I better get up. We, we actually, we released a primer on the website because we've got a lot of questions about them. Um, okay. So I better bring, <laughs> bring that up. <laughs> This is big on Twitter, by the way. Like every time some someone does crazy what's per kilo, it's just a, a shouting match of people. So it, the article's called what's per, kilo, what's per Kilogram Explained. So first of all, the, I think your question was about echelon what's per kilo. So, so people know a Filippo Ganna on a 5% gradient to go the same speed as uh Eddie Dunbar or Jonas Vingegaard or Kenny Elisond, Filippo Ganna has to do less watts per kilo, even though intuitively you would think they'd have to do the same on a 5% gradient. And that's actually, that holds true to all gradients, you know, to whatever. Now, the difference becomes smaller the steeper it gets. That's why the steeper it gets, you'll see on a Mortarolo, wow, Kenny's doing really well on this long, steep climb launching frame, whereas Kenny really struggles on this 5% climb where Wout Van Aert can go well. That's because 
the proportion of overall system weight, which is rider weight plus their bike weight, is inherently unfair to smaller riders because of the 6.8 kilogram rule. Because a 6.8 kilogram bike is a higher proportion of a 57, 60 kilo rider's body uh, body weight than a Filippo Gana 80, 85 kilos. And so, um, and also with CDA, because they're doing more absolute watts, their CDA doesn't linearly, linearly increase as their weight increases. Um, so the air, anyway, that's why I'm 5%. So we have to normalize the watts per kilo people are doing to a set weight, 60 kilo. You can pick anyone, 60 kilo, 65 kilos in a mathematical formula and say, so this is why, and, and I, you know, probably we've done, had some mistakes in the past, not clarifying this because people then say, oh, well, the, the rider even says, I didn't do that watts per kilo, but it's a 70 kilo rider. So our 60 kilo etalon normalized value is higher because it's what a 60 kilo rider would have had to push to go as fast as you, the 70 kilo rider went. And so to get to your next point about tech, so how do you account for CDA differences? Jonas Vingegaard, no, not Jonas Vingegaard, uh, Remco Evenepoel, he clearly looks more aerodynamic climbing than Sepp Kuss on a climb. So how do you factor that in? And the answer is we, we don't really. We have a set CDA. And as long as Remco's as long as Remco's position doesn't change, then he's either got that normalized watts per kilo. <laughs> Take a back step. We, we think of the echelon normalized watt per kilo value as more of a, a standardized representation of how fast you went for that time duration. Not ne- it, it's not meant to represent exactly the physiological jewels you put through the pedals normalized by your exact weight on that climb because that's impossible no one knows that impossible to know that and so if remco did seven watts per kilo for 10 minutes on that climb in that position and that position doesn't change then that's how fast he goes and Jonas has to do the same to go that speed whether he does it through the physical attributes or he has to do a little bit more because he's not as aerodynamic. The end result is he has to go that fast on that climb. Uh, and so this is where I think, yeah, there's been a little bit of confusion. That's why we released the article explaining explaining all this. And it is like, it's hard to explain all this over 140 characters on Twitter mm. Uh, mm. as well. So, because the, in the, I think it was in the Basque country, uh, Vingegaard, broke the pink line barrier which is what you guys have as the top i think it's the top 25 fastest yeah. climbing times and then draw a trend line over the duration and he's which i always thought was sort of the the taking the piss line of what's per kilo and he's broken broken it so uh, do you have thoughts on that i mean it was like seven watts per kilo for 11 minutes or something um how how is he what how is he climbing so fast well everyone's climbing faster look at low port like all the records being broken by everybody and that's the thing it's and that's why i get a little bit irritated sometimes when i see maybe articles saying two speed cycling it's 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 like no 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 the guy coming 12th is also going a shitload faster and would drop Froome when he won the tour de france so it's it's the same. Everyone's just going a lot quicker. And you can say, why is that happening? Of course, like, you know, I am an optimist and I think cycling, I think cycling unfairly beats itself up compared to other sports where like there was something in baseball today from like the 2017 world series where maybe a guy's like, yeah, I might've been on PEDs. No one cares. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying like cycling you know, these guys, we also had another article about because WADA released its 2021 doping uh, doping results across all sports and, you know, cycling is heavily tested. But, of course, not naive. In sen- humans have been cheating since the, the age of mankind um, in all facets of life. So, of course, anything's possible. 
Um, but yeah, I'd hope that it's technological advancements. It's the food, it's the calorie tracking, it's the equipment, it's, you know, all this other stuff they're doing. It's better scouting. It's getting better athletes into the sport. But, you know, I'm also not night. You don't know any, you're not living with somebody. You, you don't know everything, but you just, I think the testing is better than in other sports. It's improved. And other, otherwise, if, if you, all you think about is that, I, I question, why do you watch the sport? Like, I'm not saying don't be skeptical. I, I'm not saying don't be skeptical, but I think there's also another facet that I see on Twitter where it wouldn't matter what Watts Bikila they were doing. Hmm. The guy who wins gets tarnished, even if he was doing, you know, four Watts Bikila. It's like, why, why are you watching, man? Yeah. Okay. So the um, in terms of that, so you're saying that the Watts Bikila calculation, it's a set CDA, and I'm guessing a set rolling resistance too. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably, I mean, even just look at a tire now versus 10 years ago, I guess. Yeah. I guess that you, you, we just have to, you'd have to have faith that the people doing their calculations are keeping up to what the top teams are writing in terms of tech. Cause this, that shit all adds up. I can just, it does add up, but like the, uh, this is where we, the calculation is not guessing the power the rider did and dividing that by guessing what their weight is it's not that it's a mathematical right, okay. formula derived from a scientific paper released like 20 30 years ago it's linked in the article and then with a few with some adjustments obviously it's not just a, that is that model that estimates based on the speed based on the gradient based on the, the wind conditions which is taken from geographical institutes and it's not just like oh VAM and then what the what the kilo is because like VAM will underread on on like we've also back tested it against power data um, from a lot of from like Strava or from you know uh, internally so and that's not to say oh why would you back test against power data it's to see again that model from that paper may have been under reading on steep gradients because they didn't test it on that properly. And so there needs to be adjusted for a factor. And we know that because some power, we, we know who has the good power meters in the Peloton. We mm. even know which riders might've got signed or got extensions because they got a power meter. that's overreading. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, and so we know, okay, he's, he's a, re he's a reliable one. And so we can track at least, differences not matching it but tracking differences across that we also know like that's why i laugh like some people that like, oh but he put up on strava and his strava input weights this it's like the pros don't change their strava input weight to their <laughs> stage finishing weight and <laughs> do you know if he calibrated his power meter that morning do you know that he's using a shimano power like so that's why i think it is important to have it's not supposed to be like this is what they actually did i only consider it for internal comparison yeah. Okay. So within our system, Jonas did this on this climb based on our model. Remco did this on that duration based on our model using all the same inputs, formula, everything. So even if they're both quote unquote wrong, you know, one's high, one's lower, they're consistent. Would, would teams be able, are, are teams putting this data to use in the sense of, okay, well, Rival rival team knows. Let's let's take Jay for example. Like, okay, we need to we need to ensure that Jay has burnt this number of kilojoules or calories before that final climb. Otherwise, he's going to be able to ride at six point whatever kilos and ride away from it. So, will, will this does it factor at any point into a team's tactic yet? That kind of that kind of data. Uh, most teams. I reckon they got a pretty good idea of it, like on gut feel, but I don't think yeah, okay. they have, well, most team, well, no team has access to the database. Um, so I, like we were thinking about releasing it, but then I was like, yeah, release, you know, release the database and then what UAE just use it for free. Like, yeah. and you and also use it for free. Um, and I've, uh, you know, that is a shame for like, and maybe I will release it as like a sort of, quote unquote out of public interest but the reality is the teams are just going to like look at it and use it and 
you know, there's been a lot of work and money invested into it, not just by me, um, by the team. So, but the the answer is like, yeah, with, with the, with the Yumbo plans. Yeah. Like uh, I think about it. All right. We're going to finish up with a few little, uh, few little random ones. Um, firstly, I'm back off Twitter. I can't handle it. It's too much for me. Boys, it's, I don't know. There's, there's so much, it's like there's, there's a whole other bubble of, of people and there's a skill. Now that's what it is. There seems to be a skill to not only to, to use it, but uh, posting like God, no, like at this point, there seems to be like a way you kind of interact with people and then you have a way to comment on other people's things. And it, it sort of just I don't want to engage those people because they seem to be far more skilled at it than I can ever be bothered to be. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to have to step back. Is there any last selling point for this on me or am I done? The silence says it all. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm I'm, I'm with, I don't really know how to use Twitter either. Like I just post like, a funny thing or a funny video of what I've done and then I st- and I step away. So I'm like a, I'll provide a little bit of content and then step back out. I like I marvel. I don't ben, know how to like be in Benji's Twitter. on there and he's like, like commenting on other things. And basically he's the only person that I follow really. <laughs> and I kind of trust because he must legitimately be on there 24 hours a day. Like it's, it's he, actually he quite a lot. impressive. But how do you, okay, this is how I use it, right? It, Perry Roubaix happens. You watch it. Ha- yeah. How else are you getting a vibe for what other people thought, what the what people's takes on the controversies yes, are if you're not on Twitter? It's perfect Lantern for Rouge that. I go on podcast. there and read. Sponsored read by Zwift and GCN and Plus. During the race. Oh, during, it's, during it, the it's race is irrelevant to what us. What, are you going to go on Facebook? and? <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> there's nowhere else to get that sort of stuff. That's what it's so good yeah. for. I'd be lost if I had I to, to de- delete it. Yeah, I mean... It is because I obviously have the, and you guys do too, you got the YouTube comments, Instagram comments, the Twitter comments, and it's really interesting to compare the uh, communities and like often I'll be getting roasted for things on Twitter and then I might have said the same thing in a podcast, literally like probably I said it even in a more uh, maybe spicy way, tongue in cheek on a podcast. And if I if I tweet if I know if I tweeted that same thing, poof, people be quote tweeting it, saying you're an idiot, this and that, replying. Whereas on podcasts, people are like ah, you know, that's it's that's just what not it the is. Same toxicity. When it boils down to it, you're dead right. That's what it is. It's a totally different community, and I think it's I think it's far more pro cycling based, and I just I feel out of my depth, and I just can't. No. Yeah, engage it. I think. I think mm. that's what it is. I think you're dead right. Like, we'll we'll release a video. We might talk about all kinds of subjects. The YouTube comments will all be about like how dirty the chamois was, or how many times I wash my gloves. And if I put that same video link on Twitter, it will pick up the. Oh, I can't believe you think Remco's this. I'm like, yeah, it's a totally different community. You're dead right. Mm. I just think of it like a massive group chat. Like, because if you know, if I'm watching Rube, well, I'm going to message you and get your take. No thanks. I want to see the Twitter takes. So, yeah, I I love it for that. But I don't. I guess because um, you're using it, you're actually like tweeting and stuff. Whereas I'm just I'm just spectating. So I don't mind it. I love it. I real I I realized I had to have a presence there. Like I can't just not have some sort of presence there. But like, you know, YouTube's the big focus. Um. And to be honest, with like Twitter is a good example with Musk taking it over. Who knows what happens with Twitter? Um, probably it doesn't die, but does it expand to compete with YouTube? Probably not, or even Instagram. Um, it's just you, especially when you like actually it's you, you know your full time thing and everything, and you have to diversify your audience across these platforms because who knows what could happen to them. But um, yeah, it's Twitter is not your community. People that watch your YouTube videos or listen to your podcast, even if they think they hate listening, like they're your community. They're consuming. They're listening to you for 40 minutes, whereas someone might just see your tweet, not even know who you are, and just be like, you're an idiot. Yep. So that's <laughs> And tell difference. me so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the Cam Worth thing was really interesting, right? So 
you, you know how Ineos put that thing up about like, oh, Camworth went and did a run after Roubaix, right? And so the Instagram crowd are all like, oh, what a what a great guy, like what a he's just a iconic, like, oh, what a cool dude doing this. And the the tweets underneath are like totally disrespectful. Disrespectful to the race. Why did they select him? What a joke. Yeah. If you can do a run after a bike race like that, he shouldn't have been selected. It's just like, there it is. There's the difference right there. Oh, that thread was on the top of my Twitter feed too. I yeah. was scrolling through. I think it was like Cillian Kelly or someone like that. Just roasting, like, roasting him. I can't. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole oh, must to go and ruin Twitter because like, I didn't really care that much beforehand. But like, why is my Twitter feed? I'm an Australian living in Andorra and I get served with like British political content. And it's like, mate, is that because I'm looking at it? Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, listen, if he's listening, I'm not interested. Like it doesn't <laughs> affect me. I, I literally just want to see cycling stuff. And my for you is just so much random stuff. And I don't even follow. It goes without saying, I don't follow any British politicians. <laughs> I follow like cycling accounts. So again, it's just a weird a weird algorithm that doesn't make as much sense to me. Whereas like my YouTube homepage is like, yeah, it's cycling stuff and like random techno music. It's freaking nuts. The cycling YouTube algorithm, like your video after a stage, like I don't have to do anything and it's just there. It'll find I just, you. It's just there. Like it's, it's on the top left. Bang. Like as soon as it's uploaded, like it's, yeah. I mean, I'm not giving it any many reasons not to do that given I'll pretty much watch all of them. But, yeah, it's quite amazing. And But but then, like, Jesse, oh, this is a total sidetrack, one of your videos popped up, and I can't get it off my feed at the moment. That chain lube one of you going to wax chains, I have literally never watched it, but YouTube are just desperate <laughs> for me to watch this video. And out of pure spite, I refuse to click on it, but it's just will not get off my homepage. Really? You're not it's right. been you getting... can say not interested. I don't do that. Yes. Hey. Yes. Hey. It's <laughs> like <laughs> It's been getting 200 views a day that. for about for, for the last 6 months. It's it's doing it's not just you. It's sitting in everyone. Just yeah, it just homepage. won't go away. Uh, like it's it must. Yeah, I got it one must of them. do. My biggest video, my biggest piece of content ever is Joe Biden falling off his bike. That gets 10,000 oh. views a day. 10,000 a day. Now it's a short, so I don't get any money for it pretty much. Uh, but um, the comments are pretty funny because it's like, it's not cycling people. It's all just like Republicans. <laughs> just comment. And like, I was just thought it was a funny video for me to pretend like it was in a, a pro bicycle race. And they're like, yeah, this is great analysis. <laughs> so that's for some reason that gets served to everybody. Do you have a video that you, you that from another creator that just, just keeps getting logged to you and you will not watch it you don't remember um yeah the impossible route ones and there's a oh, logical yeah. reason for it it's because i do watch them but time and place so like i, I open youtube to maybe uh, i don't know just put on some music or something it's not you know and it, it's an, they're an hour plus long so it's like a time and place thing but it youtube knows eventually he's going to click on this because yeah, i do watch them eventually but it's like i almost I'm about to go and watch this. I have I just I decide, not you, YouTube. I decide when I'm gonna watch that. Right. Big thanks to Patrick Lanson Rich. Obviously, I'll drop the links to his channel, but you you know his channel. And we will see you super soon.